Hello and welcome back to another episode of Fully Books, the Hidden Gems author podcast, in which Craig Touch and myself, Roland Hume, chat some interesting figures and leading lights in this crazy industry we're in of writing and self-publishing. And today we have a very special guest with us who is an absolute first in fully booked history. We have Steve Piper, who is a USA Today best-selling thriller author under the name Lars Emmerich, but he is also, in a first for fully booked, an actual former fighter pilot. I don't think we've ever had a fighter pilot on the channel before. So we are absolutely delighted to have you, Steve. We're here to talk about direct sales. It's gonna be a really interesting conversation. How are you doing today? Thank you, pleasure to be here. I'm great, thank you so much. And of course, we wouldn't be here without the man himself, Craig Touch, the owner and founder of Hidden Gems. How are you doing today, Craig? Doing great. Thanks, Roland. Uh, thanks for joining us, Steve. Um, you know, we uh, we were talking about today about direct sales, and uh, I had reached out to the authors uh, that you know in our in our sort of group of of people that you know, we work with with Hidden Gems and um, ask them about the direct sales model and how many of them use it. And, and I got a pretty good response of people saying, you know, they they use it, they want to use it, they, they've tried it, they, um, they're thinking about trying it. Uh, and, and a couple of them mentioned your name and your course um, and the fact that, you know, you're sort of the go-to guy when it comes to direct sales. Um, so, you know, it's it's great that we could get you on the show and, and thanks for, for coming on. So I want to talk to you about this model, but let's start off first talking about um, you know yourself and, and your writing history and 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 why you ended up going this route and and uh, what you've set up to help authors with it. Sure, I was uh, probably still in college when my future father-in-law handed me a big thick Tom Clancy book, and I looked at the number of pages and I was like, "What does anybody do with a book this thick? This is like a dictionary." So I started reading it and I was instantly fascinated at the way these different stories taking place in different parts of the world were somehow related and then they would intertwine together and the ending would be this big explosion of all sorts of crazy things. And I was hooked and I thought, man, this would be so cool to create these things someday. But I was, you know, maybe call it 20, 21. So I had nothing to say and no way to say it. And so I set that aside for 20-ish years, maybe 16 or 17 years, went off and did other things and saw the world and uh, came back to it at a time in my life when I was just spending most of my days on the road and most of my nights in hotel rooms for, uh, for the day job. And I wanted to do something productive with that time. So I first began uh, writing business materials. And then I, was, I found myself writing a uh, case study for a sewage treatment facilities <laughs> writing about solid waste objects in the sewer system and i was like I had one of those moments where i was just like what am i doing with my life like <laughs> how did this happen to me i'm writing about who in the sewer system so i said all right that's it i'm gonna write i'm gonna write these novels so i started writing novels i never should have released the first one but i did anyway it's the beginning of the i wouldn't say the beginning it was I would say probably early days in independent publishing. And um, I had it edited a couple of times and I thought that was enough and it was not enough. I went back later and smarter, uh, but that was the beginning of it. And I did all the things that all the people suggest. I followed the British dude's guidance, uh, Nick and and Mark. And I applied a lot of what I had, you know, I had been in, in, in business online since 2003. So I had some, I had some business savvy, and I, I followed their advice and was able to execute pretty well and sold a lot of books and made a negative amount of money. I was like, well, wait a minute, this is not the way the thing is supposed to go. You're supposed to make when people buy the book, you're supposed to get more money than it costs you to get people to buy the book. At least I'm pretty sure that's how business is supposed to work, at least at my level. And so in the middle of all of that, I got a nasty gram from Amazon scolding me for some undisclosed crime against the terms of services that I that I had allegedly committed and the consequences of this crime real or imagined were that Amazon were planning to withhold a significant portion of that month's royalties so I uh, allowed that first wave of WTF to pass <laughs> <laughs> and I I wrote a, of what I thought to be a very civil email. I took some time with it to make sure that I was, 
you know, I was not al allowing the negative emotion to seep into the communication. And I, I clicked send and I went off to refresh my coffee and I came back and I had a response from Amazon. I'm like, wow, these are, these people are on it. They're sharp. This is a terrific organization. And then I opened the email and it was an autoresponder <laughs> that said, we've reviewed your case like in the 43 milliseconds between when they received it and sent the office monitor. And we've decided to uphold our decision. And furthermore, you should be very careful with how you're running your author business because we have certain terms of service around here. And if you get crossways with them, you know, dire things will happen. I never, I'd never figured out what, what my alleged wrong was. Uh, there was a, a, a couple more emails back and forth. I, I don't think I ever got a human on the line at any one, at any point. And so that was kind of an epiphany moment where I said, uh, these guys are not on my team. Whatever team they're on, I don't think I'm on their team. So if I want to build a career, I'm probably going to have to take control of my career. And by the way, why is nobody just selling directly to readers? That's like what most businesses do. They, they do a thing, they build a thing, and they sell the thing to customers. But that's not what we're doing in, in this business. And I, don't, I couldn't figure out. I, mean, I knew why, because Amazon was, it was really easy. You just upload your book and hopefully point some eyeballs at the book and good things happen. Um, but that was the start of my uh, project of figuring out if I could sell directly to readers. And lo and behold, it's a thing and you can do it. And, uh, you know, we sold lots of books over the years since then. I love how you when I you mean, you're giving your story, you're you just it's like I did some other things, which is like I graduated <laughs> the US Air Force Academy and was a fighter pilot, and you know the day job. Your day job was like uh, e like optimizing e-commerce, wasn't it? Or you you have some real no, my day job was now. It was still in the defense industry at that when I first started writing, and um, my my side hustle was was trying to get rich online, right? And in the process of that, I inadvertently had to become an expert at, at sales and marketing and product development. So those, those career paths kind of converged around, uh, around selling books directly to readers. Yeah, I mean, your story, I'm sure resonates with a lot of readers or a lot of authors that have had the same sort of experience where you get the email from Amazon that you broke some unknown rule and yeah, it's almost impossible to ever talk to anybody to figure out what you did and I, they just they don't want to tell you right they don't want it to get out because then the people that run their scams normally know what right. they what they're looking for and this and that right? right i get it from their perspective but like from our perspective it, that's not great so um you know i totally understand you know where you're coming from i guess yeah you know for most authors though their feeling is uh you know you were saying like why why don't we sell direct, right? And I guess the common thought process there is Amazon or or the other booksellers is where the readers go to find books in general. And then, you know, if we are to, if every author was to sell it on their own sites, then everybody has to like sort of find out where to go to get each book that they want, right? So I, I think that that's sort of the idea is that, you know, we have that the one the one place, but there is this other model where you can you're advertising your books anyway instead of sending them to amazon send them to yourself and i you know that's that's i guess the model the direct model right yeah the key thing you say there said there is that you have to drive advertising to your book because people are not coming to amazon to find your book there's 60 million books on amazon the books they find when they get there they're the right. top 12 and these days they're maybe the top 8 with four uh, ad advertised books on there. So the number of eyeballs on, on your book is very close to zero for most, peop most people, unless and until you point some advertising effort at that particular book. So and what's happening is that you're, you are pointing your advertising dollars to build Amazon's business and right. hopefully in the process to build your own. Uh, so the difference is just that it, actually the kind of advertising that you can do is far more effective when you can report back to the advertising platform when a purchase actually occurs. So this closed loop feedback mechanism between your store, if you are selling directly, 
and the advertiser, call it Facebook, the advertising platform, that becomes much, much more effective. And that is not available to you when you're just pointing Facebook clicks at Amazon. So there's a there's like a, a structural reason that it can be far more effective because of the kind of advertising you can do on Facebook when you are selling directly from your store. But that's the basic difference. If you're pointing ads anyway towards your books, you can point them to Amazon's business or you can point them to your business. And um, good things happen when you good things happen when you do both of them. But from where I sit, better things happen when you point your advertising dollars to your own business. And so to clarify for people, you know, when you're talking about you know the closed loop and, and being able to track everything you're talking about the idea that with facebook you can track those clicks and those sales uh only if you can you know put a pixel on your site your own site you can't track the sales once they get to amazon if you're pointing them to amazon you can't tell you all you can tell is if they clicked you can't tell if they if they made the sale right That's so exactly right. right so if you can send them to your site you can track all sorts of things um which allows you then to optimize you know who you're sending the ads to and figure out who's buying and who's not and build lists and all that stuff right that's absolutely right and it actually goes one layer one layer deeper which is that the humans who see your advertisement are known purchasers when you're out when you're able to uh, send a purchase ad it's a different kind of ad on facebook to your store so these are more expensive ads because these are more uh, profitable customers for businesses to advertise to. And the reason they're more profitable is because Facebook has watched them purchase things, right? Click on ads and purchase. So these people are known to purchase, whereas the people that you that are, are shown your ads when you're just trying to get clicks, those are the cheapest people on the platform. And the reason they're so cheap is because they don't buy. Facebook is not going to show you buyers when you're just paying for clickers. So when you can advertise to purchasers and track the purchases so that Facebook knows what success looks like, now Facebook is on your side, helping you find people for your business who have a much higher likelihood of purchasing. And then once you get a few of those across the finish line in your business, Facebook starts getting a sense I'm saying Facebook over and over again because that's where the readers are by and large. In fact, that's 69% of every advertising dollar in digital media last quarter and, and you know for many, many quarters ago. That's almost three times more revenue than Google makes in advertising. So there's that virtuous cycle of when you can, uh, when you can run a purchase ad, it's shown to buyers. And buyers go to your store and a fraction of them will purchase from you. And that information goes back to Facebook. And so this closed feedback loop is what allows you to, to grow at a much quicker rate than if you were sending non-buyers to your store or non-buyers to Amazon store. There's so another aspect to it, which, uh, which is why I was first uh, interested in what you were doing. You had an advert that ran, which is get off the Amazon hamster wheel. And for ever since I've been in this business i've uh, like i've been frustrated by what i call like the 90 day cliff which is you get paid nine, 60 days after month's end with, but your advertisers want to be paid every month or every time you reach a certain thing and it's like if you're trying to snowball things up how do you do that whereas the system of direct sales means you get paid the same day in cash that you can then put into advertising the next day and that as a game changing uh, concept is amazing it's so powerful operationally, like just as a business owner. And if you're an author, you're a business owner, like it or not. Um, when you get paid in a couple of days, it's just bank processing time between when a customer purchases and when the money shows up in your account, it's so different when that's two days and not 90. Because your credit card, your business credit card or your personal credit card, they're going to expect to be paid at the end of the month, right? Or whenever your, your bill is due. They don't care that Amazon is still two months away from paying you. So you have to carry this float. And you're exactly right. Even when things are going really well, it's really hard to scale your business when you have to carry the debt of your advertising for up to up to a quarter, like up to 90 yeah. days. 
that's a really big deal. Yeah. And I mean, these days too, the other issue is you send those people to Amazon. It used to be you send them to your product page and you know, there was very little in the way of distractions. Now there's your product page is almost a, a billboard for every other book that Amazon yeah. is selling. So you're spending those ad dollars and you're pointing people to the page on Amazon, but then those people might get distracted by other books that are on your page. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's the wild. Like when I first published my first bestseller, you could do very small amounts of marketing, and I was making ten thousand dollars a month consistently. And now you're right; you you're basically sending, paying to send people to Amazon for them to look at other books and buy other books because seventy percent of your product page is advertising for other people, other authors. That's exactly right. And what a business model, right? People like us are paying to send customers to Amazon's site where Amazon advertises to them yeah. the most profitable you know, products or the advertisers willing to pay the most for those impressions or those clicks. So it's a beautiful business model if you're Bezos. It kind of sucks if you're not Bezos though. Like if you're anybody else involved in that supply chain, particularly a supplier, um, it's and that's what you are. If you're an author uploading books to Amazon, you're a supplier to the Amazon machine. And they're ruthless about vertically integrating out suppliers you know they bezos he's not shy about it he says your gross margin i.e the money you make after the cost of the sale that's my target that's what he says so i'm coming after your gross margin i'm going to just keep eating away at your gross margin until you're out of business and i've taken over your market share and that's you know that's it's what he does and he does it very well and he's not apologetic about it but you see that playing out on your individual product detail page because it's plastered with other people's uh, advertisements that so that like Bezos is making money off of the money that you spent just to get eyeballs onto your product. Like it's beautiful from a, uh, I don't know, mercenary perspective if you're, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're Amazon, but again, if you're one of the poor schmucks trying to get people to buy your book on the page and there's, like 17 distractions on that product detail page, that's tough. I mean, that's a tough place to be. I, I do defensive advertising. So I advertise on my own product pages. So that way, all of the product ribbons are my own books because that way you don't have people leaking off. But you're right, it's like Amazon's double dipping. I'm paying to send people to my Amazon page and then paying Amazon to keep people on my Amazon page. To show your books on your Amazon page. Yeah. <laughs> you pay to get people to come see. Yeah, that, that whole right. thing is... Uh, Man. Now, that's if you had your own website, then that takes care of itself. You just only advertise your books, right? So that yeah. is sort of the direct sales model, right? That's where we're that's where we're going here. Is we're talking about, you know, instead of sending people to Amazon, send them to your website where you can show your books and you can take payment directly. You can send them the books directly. You get a hundred percent of the money. Um, but you know, there's there's other things to to think about there there's there's a lot of there's technical aspects you've got to set up your your website you got to yeah where are you going to get a website from? how are you going to right. get people to pay money for it how are you going to get people to to receive your books and and how are you yes. going to make all that profitable yes i mean there ain't no free lunch right mm -hmm. um you you actually have to run what amounts to an e-commerce business if you're selling directly to your readers and that's uh, all of those things that you talked about. It's advertising and not just throwing ads up and hoping. There's a, there's a methodical process that we follow step by step. We break the ads down into individual components and then test each of those individual components to make sure that we stand out and we resonate with, our, with the readers in our genre. And then when they click, like you say, they have to go someplace. And um, it's not it's just as easy as, a, in most cases, as a product page like on a Shopify store that works in some genres and in, in some demographics. In other genres and demographics, you typically have to stop on a sales page. And in many, many cases, you probably first have to give away a free copy of your first in series. Like that's the most profitable model that we've found for the longest. You can still send people directly to purchase, but either way, somebody has to build that page and then make it work right <laughs> and then you have to put all the back end stuff together so that when a person purchases a book from you either it shows up in the mail at some reasonable time in the future or 
if they purchase an ebook or an audiobook, that's delivered to you in a way that you can consume it. And all of that as the author business owner in a direct sales scenario, that's on you to figure out. That's on you to put into place and to make sure it works and to make sure also that it's profitable. And that's not trivial. It's a lot of effort. So it's not like this is, you know, the clouds part, the angel choirs sing, unicorns dancing in the field. It's work. Like this is hard work. It, there's nothing easy about it. Also add into the mix that there's like 60 million books out there. So this is not a market that has any scarcity in it, right? So you got to work hard to stand out and get eyeballs on your words. It's just, it's just the nature of the beast. That's, but there's, I don't know. So what kind of authors have, have you worked with and spoken to and have you seen uh failures as well as success stories the people who who can't cut it i mean i found the biggest thing when i'm selling hat is always your book your book has to be really good um yeah that's the core of every like any any business word of mouth is always working whether it's working for you or against you mostly relates to the quality of your product so um what i tell folks is that your book has to be on par with the trad, trad pub examples, traditionally published examples in your genre. And it's, I mean, you know, you see a lot of authors and, and a lot of books, you can tell within a paragraph in many cases if this book is on track. And um, you, you can tell within a chapter <laughs> after that. And the ones that remain after that really quick litmus test, it's a small, relatively small percentage, right? So right. the quality of your work always matters. The quality of your product in any business, it matters. But it matters especially in a business like this one where so somebody picks up a thriller, for example, and they're not hooked in the first chapter. Like, well, there's, there's like 100 other thrillers on my Kindle right now. I could just go pick one of those <laughs> and, and, and give that one a try instead of this one. So it totally is about related to product. The, the next thing is that... Um, we've already talked about a lot about the technical kind of details associated with this and it's not for everybody you know if you've if you spent the first six decades of your life without internet commerce it's harder to pick up all the, the tricks and all you know all of the tools and understand those um all of the the level of of skill that digital natives take for granted but older folks who didn't have that experience it's harder for them to to figure out how to you know where to click and what to put in the in the space you know so it's interesting because you know we talk a lot about uh, sort of what you were just talking about which is the idea that you know as much advertising as you want to do you still have to have a product that people want to buy and that means like you were saying uh your book has to to be well put together. You can't just say, oh, I wrote a book, I did a cover in paint and, you know, I edited it myself and here we go. Let's let the money roll in. You know, you still, even if you're not doing the direct sales model, you, you can't, you're not going to be successful that way. Right. So it sounds like all of those same things apply. And, and that means that, you know, if you're not being successful in the non direct sales model, for a lot of those reasons, you're still not going to be success. It's not going to, it's not a solution to, to fix all your woes. That's right. One of the, one of the neat things though, about when you, when you embark on the direct sales pack, or if you're even doing any advertising, say on Facebook anyway, there's a certain process you can follow to optimize those ads such that they work much better. You do that by breaking them down piece by piece. One of the elements is obviously the headline. And the way that you test the headline for advertisements to work to sell products, this is also a brilliant way to test things like your premise, your taglines, your hooks, um, even your opening sequences, say to the storylines so that you don't go off and write a book unless and until those elements score really well and that puts you way i mean that like it's 100x the odds that you're going to have a book that people care to read if you've taken the time to follow this process it's still your ideas it's still your magic right you but you're just going to test 12 ideas at a time and then your market is going to vote they don't know they're voting 
but they're going to vote and they'll come your ideas will come back rank ordered you know one through 12. and if number one is good enough it's above a certain threshold go for it there you go like now you're writing with confidence that that not only will people like it but the primary thing you're going to use to sell the book already you know that it resonates right the hooks the taglines the premise so the skill set around uh, making profitable ads is also the skill set that de-risks your writing process so that you can write a book that that resonates this works whether you're writing a novel or or, or whether you're writing a non-fiction book um still you have to execute right <laughs> uh, great topic poorly written it's not going to go all that far you get more eyeballs than a topic nobody cares about that's also poorly written of course but um, but it, it just is such an advantage to begin with statistical knowledge that you're on the right track as you start writing. So that's a neat kind of spin-off benefit of the process that we use to dial in an advertisement. It can really de-risk your product creation process as well. I mean, at the end of the day, they always call writing a craft rather than an art because you're crafting something like a carpenter when he's making a table needs a flat surface and four legs. And if you're writing a romance novel that's going to appeal to people, you need like the certain tropes that you mentioned in the blurb and it needs to be written in a certain way. And that's like you're creating a product. You are. Uh, the product is, is a work of art. Mm -hmm. So think of it this way. You when you're writing the premises that you think are going to be fun a fun book to write um you're you're creating 12 little mini works of art right uh premise number one oh i love this one it's great because it's got this premise number two oh i really like this angle it's your art it's your ideas it's the joy and the fun and you're just putting it up there and your market is voting on which of your little mini works of art is the one they would most like to read so think of it that way and then when you get that back Hey, you're still writing the sentences. You're still writing the story. You're still hitting all 28, 21, whatever, four, whatever the number is, all of those key elements in your, Beats, in your yeah. story arc. You still have to execute on that. You know, you're not you're not testing all 300 pages of your novel or whatever. And so it's it's still your art, it's still your thing, but it was begun in the knowledge that it's likely to be more popular with readers than any of the other 11 ideas that that you might have been equally happy with but your market just said eh, no we're not so interested in those right so if you you know if you're saying that um you know the, the person still has to have all these elements in place for it to be successful um when someone approaches you to to buy your um your system your course whatever you call it <laughs> um yeah. Are you are you vetting those people based on are you taking a look at what it is they're trying to sell and saying to some people, listen, you know, you've got some work to do before you should bother here or, or is it just open to anyone? And then you in the beginning, them? it was the it was the first thing where people would say, hey, I, I you know, I, I want to sell lots of copies of this. And there were two things that I looked for before I before I took anybody on as a client. And the first was. The number of titles, because it's exceptionally difficult to make money, particularly in the fiction business, with a single title. It's just hard to do. And then the second thing was the quality. And so I had many, many, many conversations where I just said, hey, uh, either you don't have enough books to, I mean, I, I don't, I couldn't guarantee that, that, uh, anybody can be profitable because they have to execute. Like I can't run their business for them, but I didn't have a, a, a strong probability. I didn't have the sense that uh, I had high confidence that I could make this series of books profitable with them. So I had a lot of those kind of conversations where I said, I don't think the covers are on par with the top 25 in your, in your genre right now. I definitely don't think the writing is on par. I think it's probably had a copy edit, but it, needs another one and it needs uh, probably a developmental edit in many cases so i had lots of these conversations lots of people were angry with me some of them went and did those things and came back 
And I was surprised to see them back because most people didn't. They just went away angry. Some of them came back and ended up selling a ton of books later. Um, so that was the way that it worked in the beginning. Like I, I didn't want to take anybody's money unless I had really high confidence that I could help them succeed financially with the business. Uh, along the way, I realized this other thing, though, about hey, you can test a book before you write it. And in fact, that's the highest leverage activity you can possibly do <laughs> if you want to sell books that you write. And guess what? The same tool set that makes the advertisement work to sell the bundle of the high quality products that we used to take on um, and still do. But this same tool set will help younger authors, newer authors, produce sufficient quality books that they have a strong probability of selling them in the future. So when I realized that, I lowered the price of the program. It's no longer invitation only. And um, anybody with a credit card can join for better and for worse. <laughs> uh, but they get access to that process to, uh, to figure out, hey, what book should I write? You know, of all these great ideas I have, what should I really invest the time to turn into a book? And as I'm turning them into a book, I need to be testing things along the way to make sure that I'm, I'm still on track. So, so your process, like if, if somebody comes to you and, and, you know, signs up for the process, what is it that they're, that they're getting exactly? Two things, the structure, how to put the tools together to sell. So the structure functions. So an advertisement leads to a landing page of some sort. If, We'll just say, take the simplest case, and that landing page might be the sales page for a bundle. And uh, the sales page, when the person clicks, it takes them to the checkout to purchase that bundle. Usually an ebook, sometimes an audiobook, sometimes a physical copy, depending on your genre and, and whatnot. So that structure has to work. And if it's an ebook, once they make the purchase, the ebook has to be delivered somehow. If it's a print book, the print book has to be delivered somehow. And the same for an audiobook. And then also when a person comes into your world, either as a customer or somebody who signs up, just signs up for your email list, that begins a relationship that plays out via email. So you need an email service provider in that mix. And how big a deal is email? Well, up to 42% of the total revenue of, of my business has come from email. So that's the first thing, the structure. But there's lots of different ways to put the structure together. All of them work. Um, but the structure doesn't make it work profitably. Like you have to know what to put in the ad, and you only know that by testing what to put in the ad. And you have to know what needs to go on the sales page, for example. And you only know that by testing the sales page over and over and iterating and improving and observing the data that comes back. So that's the testing process that makes the structure work profitably. So those are the two broad categories of what we cover in the, in the author training program. It's called AMO, by the way. And what does AMO stand for? I... It's Author Marketing Mastery Through Optimization. Sounds so hardcore, I like it. It is AMO. hardcore, it's hardcore. <laughs> AMO. <laughs> Nobody says, yeah, and I'll tell you what, you know, uh, I take endless grief over that in, as, the number of school shootings has increased over the years. And I, I regret having chosen that acronym for that reason alone. But it's out there and people refer to it that way. Uh, and it is hardcore. Nobody, nobody who's done this says, oh, this was the easiest thing I've ever done. Because it's not. I mean, it's, it is a pain in the ass. But no about it. the thing is whether or not it works. I mean, and it all comes right. down to one cent, doesn't it? I remember the first time I started advertising my books and realizing i was making a profit i was just like oh my god and then you improve the improve that margin but i mean anytime you're making a profit you're making a profit you've got a machine where you insert money and you get more money than that that out it's like discovering fire or something <laughs> that's exactly right that's exactly right yeah I, I i still remember the day when uh what i just was you know I wouldn't say inventing the process, but kind of inventing the process and and trying to get it to work. I remember the first day that it worked profitably, and I knew that this changes everything. Like this is this is a big deal. 
So if if somebody did you know sign up for the process, are they just given a bunch of materials to read and go do, or do they have access to you, or is there a community? How does how does it all work once they've signed up? Yeah, and in, in the beginning, my idea was I'm just going to put everything I know into courseware and it's going to be perfectly clear and everybody will be able to diagnose perfectly what might be going wrong in their in their situation and fix it. Uh, it didn't turn out that didn't turn out to be the case. I did as a precaution have weekly coaching calls for the early clients and um, those turned out to be really valuable because I had seen just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things over the years and had some experience fixing them and getting them to work right. So that's, um, and it, it, it came with the course when the course was 6,000 um, bucks. It doesn't come with the course now that it's a thousand bucks, but it is a, a subscription upsell. We meet three times a week and um, it's not like cheerleader session, rah, rah, keep going, keep trying. We actually look at data and look at the specific area that they're working on and offer specific um, you know, suggestions for how to make changes to it. So it's really like in the trenches with them. And we also have a, a, a Facebook group where people can post questions outside of the call hours or if folks who didn't sign up for the call and uh, they'll often get really quick, really great answers. I think that's that's one of the other things as well. When it comes to advertising, it's not like you build the system and it works flawlessly first time out of the box. It's like you build the system and then from the data that you can get, you know which areas to improve and things. I mean, That's right. um, I know on Amazon, I changed the font size for my blurb once and got 50% more conversions. But the, the benefit of, of your system as opposed to working with Amazon is you don't get the same level of information to work with from Amazon. They have affiliate co affiliate tags now, which give you a lot of a lot more information. But I mean, when you're doing it with your own website, you can check you know, when they landed on your page, how long they stayed on your page, which part of the page they read, whether they went through to the next page, whether they um, read the sample that you might have given them, whether they went to check out, whether they like every single thing there. And you can see where there's something that's tripping them up and work on that and improve it. But it is a process of improving things, improving things, improving things until you, until you take making a loss into turning a profit. Yeah, that was you said that perfectly. That's exactly right. You just look at the details of the customer experience. And there are cool tools out there that are, they're anonymized. So you don't know which individual's session you're watching, but you can watch a person um, almost in real time as they're working their way through your page. And you sort of get a sense for what they might be thinking as you're doing it. Again, it's anonymized. It sounds creepy and big brother. Really, you're doing this so that you can give them a better experience. So you find the friction points and then you attempt to remove those friction points and if you've removed all the friction points and the person gets all the way down to that point where they're making the choice, I'm going to buy this or I'm not going to buy this, um, you can, there's some other additional things that might be psychologically missing that you can discover by first getting rid of all the things that's on the page that have scared people away <laughs> prior to getting down to that purchase opportunity. So it, that's kind of the level of detail that you wind up at. And if that's making your stomach turn <laughs> right now, <laughs> I sympathize. It's uh, you know, it's a lot. But again, we're in an industry where we have like, depending on your genre, ten million competitors, right? So you've got to do something to stand out, and that comes down to just providing a better customer experience that that just more closely matches what they're looking for. And you can only do that by watching how they actually behave out in the wild. I. Oh, go on, Craig. Uh, well, uh, do you have a, another question? Because I, what I want to do is I want to go through some of the questions that I got from um, some of the authors that sent me uh, that sent me some stuff once when I asked about direct sa sales. Um, and the, you know, there's a there's a bunch of them. You know, fairly quick. Um, but if you have something else you wanted to ask, go ahead. Well, all I was going to say is I think that's one thing that perhaps we've lost sight of in the e-commerce thing is that every person who clicks in your ad is an actual person. And then when they, they are a person sitting there staring at a computer screen like you do, scrolling through, and they do things on that, that I think we lose sight in e-commerce. You have so many impressions, so many clicks, you just think of them as numbers, when actually every single one of them is a human being. And if you can think of their experience from, have the empathy of like, 
a human uh, being going through this, it will help you make that better. And I didn't really understand that until I researched direct sales. Uh, and, and I think it really helped change my perspective on advertising as a whole. That That's is the I'm magic. Thinking. It's 100% mm -hmm. the magic. Sure, there's numbers to help you. Those numbers, they're like, you can think of them like a connection meter. How well am I connecting with the human on the other end of this ad or the other end of this experience? And when you view things through that lens, you just use these tools to help you understand, are you reaching and resonating with the person on the other end of all of this? And when you've got that in your mind, it sort of clarifies everything else for you. It's a, it's perfectly said, Roland. thank you. Right, over to you, Craig. I'm dying to hear these questions, actually. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, so, yeah, like I mentioned before, I had asked some questions of people about, you know, whether they're doing direct sales. And um, I did get some people with some questions and, and I thought I'd fire these off. And listen, if, if they're not simple answers, then, you know, feel free to just, you know, say that <laughs> there's there's a lot there or whatever. Uh, you know, you can give a, a very simple sort of a high level or, or more in depth um, or you know, if, if you're covered in your course, you know, feel free to talk about it. But uh, I figured I'll just I'll just fire some of these off. So, uh, you know, obviously to be able to do this, especially if you're an Amazon author, you've got to be wide, right? Because uh, you can't be in KU, right? Because you can't, you're not exclusive. So yeah, that's a great question. You can't be, so if you're in KU and loving it and it's paying the bills and life is good, you probably don't want to mess with that. Um, but you can sell directly your audiobooks unless you're in that ex that other exclusive deal and you can sell directly your paperbacks and there are folks who are selling two to 400 copies of their paperbacks every single day directly to customers um, so you what you can't do if you are in KU is at least according to the terms of service you're not allowed to try to sell your ebooks that are also in KU even on your own website right. So yes, that's that's definitely a thing, but that doesn't mean that you can't do any direct sales, um, right? And then, well, so then the other part to that is the idea that um, you know Amazon does price matching. So I guess you have to make sure your prices are are the same as they are on Amazon. I mean, you're you're still going to be getting more more of it in your own pocket, anyways. But in general, if you were to have a lower price or have a sale or something like that, Amazon could potentially then change your price on Amazon. Potentially. Um, if they find it. <laughs> yeah, and if they if they cared to. The first thing I'll say is that uh, most indie authors price their books, in my opinion, way too low. Um, you know, there's, there's no benefit whatsoever to being the second lowest priced supplier. There's a lot of benefit to being the most expensive one because the respect that people give to your product before they even open the book depends a lot on the price they paid for it and this is just a fundamental element of psychology i i see this uh in my book sales i also see it in in the way that people perform inside of the ammo program the ones who pay the most for it out earned everybody else by 11 times so it, this is like a fundamental thing that of psychology which is your pricing is your positioning so if, you're type, you, if your books deserve uh, to be priced at the top end of the indie pricing scheme for your genre, you should price them and you shouldn't be shy about it. And if you wanna offer a discount, uh, like a bundled discount from your store, such that the per unit price is lower than the list price of each of those individual books, I don't know that Amazon has anything to say about it necessarily. They certainly haven't in practice. So, um, right. That's one way around it is, you know, create a bundle that doesn't exist on Amazon and, yeah. and then they can't price match anything there. Um, you know, we talked about the idea that, you know, when you're sending people to Amazon, you are sort of, uh, you know, advertising for Amazon or, or people go to your product page page and then they can go elsewhere. Um, but there's also the idea that, you know, you sell on Amazon, it ranks you, then you get onto the organic list. Um, when on your pages, do you generally have links to your book on Amazon or you're just basically you know, just buy it here and you don't even talk about it, but obviously people would then go to Amazon if they wanted to, just to buy your book. Yeah. You know, felt like that was more trustworthy or something like that. It's the second thing. So, um, 
we don't generally provide off ramps to Amazon from our own assets. What does happen is there's a certain category of people who are Amazon diehard customers. They're only ever always going to read something they they got directly on their Kindle. And it's easier for them. If they buy an ebook from Amazon, it just shows up on the Kindle and it's done. It's over with. It's a couple extra steps when they purchase it from, from you, unless they have the book funnel app. And if they have the book funnel app, guess what? It just shows up on their book funnel app, just like it does on the Kindle. But um, the way it works in practice is a thing called the called cross channel effects. So you advertise on Facebook, for example, for your direct purchase offer on your store, and a person sees that goes, "Oh, I would like to read this. I'm going to go search for it on Amazon," and they type your name or the book title into their Amazon search bar and buy your book there. And so that's why we see in 100% of cases. Amazon royalties are increasing when people start advertising, particularly when they start scaling, but often from the very beginning, they start seeing increase in Amazon royalties. That's interesting. But I'm old school advertising. I used to work in radio stations and stuff, and we used to talk about the seven touches there, which of course you can't do now because of hashtag me too, but seven touches wasn't wasn't quite so, <laughs> so sketchy then. It means your if somebody sees your product advertised in seven different places, once on the radio, once in the newspaper, once on TV, yeah. once on a billboard, then that's when it enters their mind as a thing. And so I guess even if you're advertising to sell directly, you're still doing one of the seven touches so they can go and think about your product when they're on Amazon. You are, but we're using a different style of advertising called direct response. Mm -hmm. And the way the direct response ad is, is written and constructed, it's meant to invite immediate action, even if this might be the first time a person has seen it. And it does tend to work that way. Uh, and you know, it's, uh, it's been around for a really long time. Um, I'm sure you've, received one of those uh, direct direct response mailers at some point and read some shockingly compelling story about some shockingly mundane product that <laughs> suddenly made you think goodness i need one of these for my home um so it's a style of advertising that that is uh it works more quickly than the style of advertising that you're talking about which is typically more a branding kind of style of advertising so um, branding works for sure. It just works over a much longer time scale and over a much larger ad spend than most authors, myself included, would really care to spend. So we aim more toward direct response, which is giving a customer a really good reason to check out your product or your offer right now. Okay, a couple more. I know we're running out of time here, but um, do you find that there are certain genres that do better than others? Uh, is it you know nonfiction versus fiction, or or you know something like that, or is it just just anybody can be equally successful? Um, it's the genres where it's difficult to be successful selling physical copies directly are those genres with high page counts. So think like epic fantasy and maybe some memoir. That's just a function of the number of pages you have to rip and print, and then the number of miles you have to ship all those pages to get them to your, to your customer's door. Um, in those genres where prices are depressed, think like romance, what we often see is quantity overcomes per unit price. So if a, if a thriller bundle might have, call it four to six books, really successful romance bundle might have 10 to 12 to meet the kind of price point that pays for the advertising that got the eyeballs there. So all that's to say um, it's down to the author in basically every genre. And I should say it's down to the author, business owner, right? So is the product great and is the marketing on point? And those two things have to converge. 
Um, okay, so that leads into the like sort of shipping related questions, which you know are, are somewhat technical. But um, I guess it comes down to: Are you doing it all yourself? Because there's questions around, you know, do you have to keep a whole bunch of inventory on hand, and how do you, you know, how do you ship from Canada to the U.S. or any country to the U.S. or or wherever your sales are coming from, and you know the costs of that and and all that, or are you using some sort of uh, you know person or, or or service that that does all that for you all of the above all of the above um you, print on demand is is super convenient you pay f you pay for that service and that eats into your margins um there was a paper shortage for a while that drove those prices up shipping costs are higher that has driven those prices up as well so um there were a number of providers that sort of rode piggyback on ingram sparks printing capacity which was basically global i mean you could an order could come in to your shopify store for example and somebody in australia could order a print copy that is produced and shipped from australia and shipped to your customer in australia and your store might be based in the united states um, so that landscape is changing ingram spark and the uh, companies they resell to they're pricing themselves out of the game and there are some people now, uh, Book Vault being one of them, that are ascending to sort of fill that uh, lower price market. That's the print on demand. Another way to do it, and the way that will always get you better margins by a mile, is to order, make a wholesale order from a printer in some bulk quantity. Whether you process those every time an order comes in yourself, or whether you have them ship to an author assistant who does this for you, or whether you contract with a thing called a 3PL, a third party logistics operation, like they'll, they'll uh, pick, pack and ship your title for you. The economics for all of those options are slightly different. Uh, so we have a process that we, we try to have folks walk through so that you do that smartly. Uh, but there's a lot in that game as well. So it, you know, it's just a matter of where are you in the process of developing your physical book sales, you know, to your readership. So okay, no and then like sort of, most simple, super one size fits all kind of answer. Right, uh, and then sort of the last one is just around you know collecting money and and taxes and all that stuff. I, I imagine that when you're setting up a website, you probably have different plugins and such that could handle a lot of that for you. Yeah, there, there are third party plugins for most, uh, certainly for Shopify that help sort of simplify the tax situation. I will say that um, nobody has this figured out <laughs> because the taxes are different, not just state by state in the US, but county by county, and then sometimes municipality by many, you know, town by town. And uh, there's no enforcement mechanism for the town of Poughkeepsie, Idaho, to enforce your, the sales tax situation from your store in New Jersey or whatever. So this is a really, this is a really big nationwide, worldwide situation that is not, it is not lying flat. There is a lot of uncertainty in every corner of it. That said, your Shopify store will tell you, hey, you need to pay sales tax in Kentucky now. So go get your stuff set up in Kentucky. And then there's an app that you can plug into your store that will figure that out for you as well. I mean, tax is a problem if you publish on Amazon as well. I mean, you at the end of the day, you get paid your, your things and you have to, to figure out a lot of your tax stuff anyway. Doesn't Amazon do that, though? Because they're the seller of records. Oh. So the Amazon has a tax problem. What they give to you, like they charge that on top of, you don't actually ever see that in that sale price amazon figured that out for you that's money that never touches your hands and on your shopify store though somebody in kentucky may say you're not liable for x dollars because you sold x dollars of worth of product and shipped them to my town in kentucky for example um, but that's where the app comes in on your shopify store for example to help you with that that's a whole level of extra complexity that i had not even thought about it is in theory when you think about it your brain breaks in practice it's not a thing yet really 
that's a good answer. <laughs> well, that's that's all the ones that I had. So thanks for for clearing all that up. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and we've gone over time a bit, but what a fascinating discussion! I am so sure that people are going to be glued into this. Steve, where can people find out more about what it is you do? Uh, you could just head over to ammoauthor.com, A-M-M-O-A-U-T-H-O-R.com, and it'll ask you, hey, do you write fiction or do you write nonfiction? And then I'll put you over to the right place. That's brilliant. And Craig, do you have any final questions before we wrap up? No, I burned through all my questions there, but thanks uh, again for, for coming on and really you know, illuminating this very complicated issue for for so many people and i'm sure there are uh authors out there that not only appreciate this but will likely sort of look into your course or you know i know that there are other ways to do it but you know it seems like you've been doing it for a while you've got it all figured out by now so um definitely if if they're not going to try to do it themselves they're they're best off looking for for someone like you for help thank you it, great opportunity to be on with you guys i really appreciate it and it, yeah, like it, there's a lot of com complex details and you can get as nerdy about it all as you want. But at the end of the day, it's just you selling your stuff to other humans. And that's 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 a cool thing. You know, like I I love that more intimate relationship. I love hearing from my readers who tell me about stuff going on in their lives. And and uh, it's just a cool it's a cool relationship that you can build with your readers and, and fans and help them become super fans down the line. Well, that's a brilliant way of looking at it. Steve, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. This has been absolutely fascinating. I'm really, really overjoyed we got to, to have a chat to you. And if you've appreciated what Steve has to say, whether you're listening on your favorite podcast channel, whether you're watching on YouTube, head down to the comment section, leave Steve a comment, let him know how much you appreciate what he came and shared here today. And while you're down there, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. There's a little bell icon so you get, uh, a, you get notified every time we have a new episode of Fully Booked. Speaking of which, we'll be back with another episode of Fully Booked next week. So until then, stay tuned. Thank you very much.